This is not info material. Error. Hey everyone, how's it going? I'm Doug here, and we're back with chapter 8 of Archangel. Last time we read chapter 7, which was a good tour through Zezerat, Bodice's city that was raised from hell onto earth, and we learned a lot of the, the nasty stuff that's going on nowadays. But um, let's just jump right into chapter 8. Chandra, Uriel, you're back. Raphael greeted the pair as they closed Sanctuary's sturdy door behind them. He stood at one of the tables in the spacious antechamber of the underground refuge amid most, if not all, of the other angels. Some of them looked towards the newcomers with interest, others with unmasked disgust. Despite the others, Uriel could not help but notice how genuine Raphael's smile was. Adriel, the angel who helped Chandra just before they had ventured into the city, also gave them a small smile. He stood next to the same toned, young-looking angel from before, and his smile did not hide his apparent fascination with the two. Good, good. Please, get some rest, my dear, Raphael continued, mostly addressing Chandra. We are leaving in a few hours. Leaving? Uriel could not hide the confusion in his voice. Raphael, we were only to begin forming our plans tomorrow. We cannot possibly be ready to go anywhere. The older archangel moved around the table, his motion causing some of the many papers to wave and shuffle in his wake. He walked up to Uriel and put a hand on each of his shoulders. You have renewed our hopes in this war, Raphael's voice bordered on childish excitement. We have books full of plans already, Uriel. We have nothing but plans. Now that you are here, we can put those plans to action. We can bring the fight to our enemies. A light shone in Raphael's eyes that Uriel had seen many times before, though it seemed like it had been ages since he had seen it last. The younger archangel looked around at the others in the room. They looked weary and worn down, like refugees rather than warriors. But a handful of them, more than Uriel would have thought, had that same light in their eyes. They had been confined to the sewers for too long, and now Uriel gave them a chance to break free. But that light and that hope were not enough. Do you truly think that they are ready to launch an assault? Uriel whispered. Some nearby angels heard the hushed exchange. Their gazes fell to the floor at the question. Their limbs are stiff with complacency, their minds hazed over with doubt. They are not ready for war, brother, and neither are you. The words hit Raphael like a punch. The light in his eyes dimmed, but it refused to vanish. Do not mistake our refuge for a prison, Raphael spoke loud enough for everyone to hear. We have been waiting years for the right moment to strike back against the legions of hell, but we have been far from complacent. Each day has been spent training, honing our skills, scouting the world that we are trapped in. If we were complacent, then we would be dead. No, my brother, we are ready for this. Many of the heads around the room, including Adriel's, nodded in agreement. Uriel was not convinced. He had seen the underused training rooms, the forgotten altar, and worst of all, the defeated look that still lived on the faces of many of the angels. You cannot take this from us. Uriel found it difficult to meet his brother's eyes. He could see how passionate the archangel was about this, how being caged like an animal had taken its toll on all of them. Then prove it, Uriel said coolly. He unbuckled the belt that held his blades and tossed it to the side. The sheathed weapon slid to Chandra's feet. A disbelieving murmur ran through the crowd of angels, that the archangel who had arrived not even a day ago was challenging their leader. Raphael laughed as he removed his own cloak, a longer, heavier one than Uriel had been wearing. Raphael's black leather vest could not hide the bulging muscles of Uriel's larger brother. Speed had always been on Uriel's side, but Raphael made up for it in sheer strength. The older archangel shifted his stance, legs separated and fists raised. The brothers would frequently spar in heaven, but this was different. This time, Raphael had something to prove. You know I respect you, Uriel. Raphael cracked his neck as he spoke. But there is still much that you need to learn, especially now. The other angels formed a circle around the two brothers, but Chandra stayed where she was. Either she was disinterested or her mind was elsewhere. Uriel did not know. He paid it no mind, though, and said already sizing up Raphael. His stance, the way he slowly crept around the edge of the circle, where his eyes focused. He looked far more ready than Uriel would have given him credit for. But the angel knew that this fight would be over quickly. The brothers moved closer to each other while continuing their slow, circular pace. Raphael was just out of Uriel's reach when he suddenly lunged forward, a fist flying at Uriel's head. Uriel easily sidestepped the attack and went to counter, but found himself dodging backwards instead. Rather than following through with his punch, Raphael stopped short, feigned the strike, and now pursued Uriel with a flurry of blows. Faster than his brother, Uriel was able to avoid or deflect strike after strike, but was continually driven back towards the line of angels that marked the edge of the circle. Planting his feet, Uriel brought both his forearms up and out, breaking Raphael's assault and forcing his fists far to either side. Uriel took advantage of the small opening, climbing his brother's torso with punches, stomach, chest, nose. Raphael reeled backwards, stunned and out of breath. He laughed as he wiped the small stream of blood trickling from his nose. I thought we were actually going to hit each other, little brother. 
He took four quick steps forward, bridging the gap between the two faster than Uriel thought he could. Uriel did not wait around this time, though, launching into another burst of strikes before Raphael could start his own. The larger Archangel blocked most of the onslaught, but Uriel managed to slip through a few hits. Raphael barely flinched at the body shots, merely grimaced and attempted to return the favor. Uriel's confidence grew as more and more of his punches made contact. His moves became mechanical and automatic, an extension of his millennia of training. Uriel's fist shot out, but Raphael predicted the attack and ducked underneath it. He retaliated by connecting a fist to Uriel's stomach, knocking the wind out of his younger brother. Desperate to hold his ground, the winded archangel tried to counter with a sloppy punch. Raphael sidestepped and grabbed his brother's wrist in a painful vice. Defenseless, Uriel suffered punches to his side and face, each one doubling him over or staggering him, but not knocking him back far enough to pull away from Raphael's grasp. Out of desperation, Uriel kicked his foot out, swiping along the ground and tripping Raphael. The older archangel was forced to release his grip on Uriel to stop from falling on his face. A quick kick to the side kept Raphael from rising. Another ripple went through the crowd around them. Uriel knew the fight was over and turned away from his defeated brother to address the rest of the angels. But Raphael was not helpless, not even close. He reached out and wrapped his arms around Uriel's leg. With a twist, Uriel came tumbling to the ground and Raphael was quick to roll on top of him. Before he could react, Uriel felt something cold pressed up under his chin. He glanced down and saw Raphael holding one of his pistols. A silence washed over the room, save for an agitated half-demon pushing her way to the front of the crowd. The world has changed, Uriel, Raphael muttered, the eyes of the two archangels locked with one another. Do not think that because you were up there and we were down here, you are so far above us. Uriel just smiled, accepting his defeat. He hated to admit it, but sometimes his older brother was right. Then what is the plan, brother? Scene break. Raphael laid out his strategy in detail to Uriel and the other angels. Standing around the table, it was clear who was okay with his and Chandra's presence and who was not. Only a few of the nearly 30 warriors could tolerate to be near the pair. Most made no attempt to hide the fact that they tolerated them only because Raphael protected them, or rather, because the two archangels protected the half-demon. If it bothered Chandra, she did not let it show. It was clear that the archangel spent most of his time planning for an opportunity like this. His contingencies had contingencies. Uriel looked over the array of maps and notes sprawled along the large table in the antechamber. What Raphael proposed was an all-out assault on a nearby town that housed a sizable number of Botus' demons. Their assault was more a systematic cleansing of the town than a fight, but Raphael also believed that angels and humans were held in a prison near the town, so he wanted as many angels as he could spare to come for the raid. We will enter the town from the west and work through it in blocks, Raphael said, pointing to various buildings and roads on the map as he explained. Uriel. You and your friend will come with me and my group. Fariel will lead the others so that we will create a net that no demons can escape from. We will go our separate ways at this intersection and then regroup. Do you not think it better for each company to have an archangel? Uriel interjected. He did not relish the thought of needing a babysitter, nor was he impressed that Raphael thought another angel, Fariel, could rightfully take his place in charge. Not this time, Uriel, Raphael said calmly. You are still new to this world and to many of us here. Fariel can handle the lead this time. Uriel bit his tongue so as not to press the point. He did not appreciate being treated like a child and was even more annoyed that his brother doubted him. From the way they spoke, Fariel appeared to be the archangel's second in command, no doubt a result of the two bonding over the last decade on Earth. It saddened Uriel that they might be closer than the two archangels were. What's the point of this attack? chimed one of the angels from the group. Twofold, Raphael responded quickly as if expecting, no longing for, the question to be asked. It is a boneyard, a place where angels are sent to be executed and where humans are held until the next shipment of slaves are sent to Botus's elite. It is a vile hub of flesh trafficking. We will take it and free whoever is held there. After that, we will use it to ambush any shipments, supplies, or otherwise that pass through the town. It will deal a major blow to Botus. Won't he realize that he isn't getting his meat? Chandra asked. Her voice was met with stares of venom, but she kept her eyes on Raphael. Uriel was glad that she would be under the protection of both archangels during this excursion. He would not put it past some angels to try and attack the Cambion when he was distracted. The half-breed is right. This will only attract attention to us, came another voice from the crowd. Chandra might never earn the trust of all of them. Perhaps there was some measure of safety back at the cottage with her sister. Paying the slight no mind, Raphael only responded to the half-demon. Botus is lazy, complacent. His minions will be afraid to report on any kind of failure, which means it will be a few days before the snake catches on. I believe we can do enough damage to hurt Botus' supplies before he realizes what is happening and where. By the time he does, we will have moved on to somewhere new, doing the same thing over and over again. He will not be able to keep up with us. We will chip away at him, piece by piece. 
Whispers of agreement and excited mumblings came from the angels. Chandra shot Uriel a quick smile. Even the younger archangel had to admit that he was excited at the prospect of renewing a fight he had been kept out of for over a decade. All right, Raphael continued when the crowd had settled. So the groups will rendezvous here. From there, we continue as one towards this building. Uriel looked at what appeared to be a massive structure, perhaps some kind of hospital or residence. It was easily half the size of the town itself when one combined the main structure and all the outbuildings. Unlike the rest of the community, though, it was a few kilometers from the town. I believe this is where they hold the prisoners, angels and humans alike. It is an old psychiatric hospital, which I doubt is any sort of coincidence. Chandra laughed. An asylum? Fucking perfect. Scene break. It is time to prepare for our journey. Chandra felt a gentle touch on her arm. It was too soft to be someone who wanted to kill her, so she figured it was trying to wake her up. Chandra was not used to this much excitement in her life. An archangel showing up out of nowhere and dragging her into a suicide mission it was more effort than she bargained for. When she and Uriel got back from their tour of the city, the adrenaline that had kept her going faded. It wasn't a lot of sleep that she got, but it was enough for now. Fuck right off, Chandra muttered, still half asleep. She rolled away from the pestering touch. A girl needs her sleep. She could feel the awkwardness of whoever knelt there silently next to the old mattress, wondering if they should nudge her once again. Chandra sighed and stretched her limbs. When she rolled over, she saw Uriel with a confused look plastered on his face. Don't worry, choir boy. I'm awake. Uriel did not look away as she sat up in her bed. Chandra had removed her leather garb and sported only a small black bandeau. Her skin was pale, as if it was only a thin veil covering the light of the moon. And, like the moon, Chandra's body was riddled with scars, cuts, burns, even bites. The lines read like a book of anguish. He was so caught up in its story that he did not even register Chandra's hand until it was pushing his face away. Don't go getting any ideas, Angel. The half-demon forced his gaze away from her. We have demons to kill. Think about them instead. If Uriel was here, then it must have been close to dawn. Most creatures would be turning in for the night, and the city's guards would be changing. The dull glow of dawn would hide the angels as they scurried out of the city. Uriel turned and walked out of her makeshift room. My apologies, Chandra. I did not mean anything by it. Find me when you are ready to depart. The Cambion was worried that Uriel did not understand sarcasm at all. It would take time, she thought as she smiled and rest herself. Chandra made sure she had the dagger that Uriel had given her when they had started their journey. It was designed for throwing, there was no doubt about that, but the diamond-shaped blade was as sharp as any the Cambion had ever seen. Lastly, Chandra grabbed her bow and quiver of arrows. It dawned on her that her handful of ammunition would not be enough for this attack. Her arrows were powerful, blessed by Hadriel to turn any demons they struck to dust and ash, but they would do her no good if she used them all. Such a pain, Chandra whispered to herself. Now she needed to find where they kept the arrows around here. Presumably she should just ask, since the half-demon did not want any of the angels to think she was stealing from them. Chandra hustled out of her room to find the one angel that she knew would not kill her for talking to them. Perhaps two, she mused. Adriel had not been hostile to her the day before. He had not been particularly kind, either, but rather curious about Chandra and Uriel. It comforted her, knowing that not all angels saw her eyes and immediately went for their weapons. The half-demon was so lost in thought that she almost crashed into Raphael. Apologies, my lady, Raphael said with a half-bow. Chandra giggled. Make that three angels who would not kill her. Are you ready to leave? Since you mention it, Chandra shrugged the shoulder that had her quiver behind it. I could use some more arrows. Have any to spare? The archangel nodded and waved for the half-demon to follow him. They moved quickly, as everyone had already congregated in the common room. She figured they were annoyed at her for delaying their first fight in a long time, but Chandra was so used to looks of disdain and hatred that they hardly even registered anymore. Raphael led her into one of the larger rooms in Sanctuary. It was long and filled with targets made of wood and brambles. Some of the targets were peppered with arrows, the majority of which were clustered around the bullseyes. Along the back wall were racks and tables full of weapons and ammunition. She saw blades, maces, hammers, arrows, daggers, and some pieces of steel she had never seen before. Each arrow had an ebony shaft and similarly dark fletching. Take as many as you need, Raphael offered as he swept his arm towards the arsenal. Some of the weapons were made in the forges of heaven. Most, like the arrows, are of this world, though. I can't say either place has done me any favors. The half-demon immediately regretted the words. They were true, but saying so to Raphael would not earn her any friends. She quickly changed the subject when she saw the gleaming arrowheads before her, though. You're kidding me, she said as she picked up an arrow. The archangel laughed. The shining steel arrowheads were shaped into ornate crosses, each formed into a deadly point with two wicked barbs on either side, but Raphael understood how they must look to the Cambion. I know, I know. He held his hands up in surrender. We did not make them ourselves, but found them in an outpost that had been overrun. 
The craftsmanship is of high quality. Chandra laughed as she shook her head. She filled her quiver with as many arrows as she could. The black fletching of the mundane arrows was easily recognizable from the white of her spelled ones. She had dyed them that color to remind her of the angel who had given them to her. So, are you Christian angels then? Is all of that Bible crap true? Hadriel never gave me a straight answer. Some of it, Raphael said with a smile. But religion is a human concept. Angels, heaven, hell, we do not belong to any faith or denomination. We exist, no more or less than we did before man knew how to worship. How humans choose to accept our existence is their choice. So, no? The Cambian asked with a smirk. So no, no more than any other religion. Raphael turned to lead the half-demon out of the room. Chandra went to follow, but hesitated when she saw the beautiful weapons that were forged by angels. Aside from Uriel's daggers, she had only ever seen an angel's weapon once before. Raphael. Chandra's words were a little weaker this time, not her confident, sarcastic self. Yes, Chandra. When all this is over, would it be possible for us to bring my sister here on our way back? Chandra's red eyes were filled with worry. I've left her on her own for longer than this before, but something is different this time. She's just a kid. I know the others don't like me being here, but being around a mob of angels would be a lot safer for her than alone in a cottage. Raphael's smile was genuine when he turned to face the half-demon. Of course, we would be happy to have you both. And do not worry about the others. They may dislike you now, but years of survival have put that wall up. Just give them some time to break it down. You may be a half-demon, Chandra, but you are a far cry from those beasts we are hunting. I see that, and they will too. Sanctuary can be home to both you and your sister. A warmth filled Chandra's body, starting from her core and seeping into her limbs. She tried to give her thanks to the angel, but she could not form the words. Raphael seemed to understand. Silently, the pair walked back to the throng of eager angels. Scene break. Uriel was strapping on his belt as his brother and his new companion made their way back to the antechamber. His sword was sheathed on his left hip, its ornate golden grip a statement of both quality and power. Two of his daggers were sheathed on the front of his belt, one on either side of the buckle, while another four sat comfortably behind him. The blade that he had given Chandra had been replaced from the armory that the angels had in Sanctuary. Uriel still sported a rough brown leather vest and faded pants. His dark boots looked heavy, but the archangel did not show it when he moved. Again, he opted for the black cloak that Raphael had given him, rather than his longer jacket. All set, brother? Raphael clapped the younger archangel on the shoulder as he walked past. Uriel gave a quick nod before turning to Chandra. And you? Uriel asked the Cambian. Are you prepared for this? You bet. Chandra was able to find words again. She was more than ready for this, especially if it meant her sister would be safer afterwards. She hooked her arm around one of Uriel's and tugged the archangel along as she followed Raphael and the other angels towards the door. Let's hit the road, choir boy. A few of the nearest angels murmured in obvious disgust at any contact between the Cambian and one of their kind. A quick glance their way from Uriel silenced them. But, surely to their delight, Chandra had to let go of the archangel to leave sanctuary. The half-demon did not hesitate when she walked through what looked like a stone wall to her. They joined the stream of angels that curved through the sewers like a massive serpent. The smell of waste and rot was still present, but Uriel did not notice it nearly as much. Uriel, Raphael's voice carried from the front of the line. It's a bit dark in here, don't you think? The younger archangel took the cue, though he was concerned at Raphael's lack of subtlety. He could tell that his brother and the other angels were excited, but they needed to worry about their own survival until they were well beyond the city. Still, Uriel raised a clenched, glowing blue fist to his mouth and whispered into it. With a final puff, he unfurled his fingers, and the darkness seemed to recede all around them. There was no true source of light, only an absence of darkness. Neat, Chandra said, nudging the archangel with her elbow. Thank you, brother, Raphael's voice came again. The group did not walk for much longer, but in that short time Uriel saw more of the sick and dying that chose the sewers as their final resting place. He was disturbed at how adept the others had become in ignoring the suffering that they walked past, heads and eyes forward as if the humans did not exist. Then they came to what appeared, at least to Chandra, as a dead end. She wondered if they had taken a wrong turn, but then watched as one angel after another walked right through the wall. Damn it, the Cambian said, vocalizing her frustration. All this angel magic makes things very difficult for me, you know that? Uriel laughed and led her through the small corridor that only angels could see. The passage was narrow, and terminated in what looked like the ebony stone that made the foundations above. Chandra knew better than to say anything this time. She followed Uriel through the not-so-solid rock into the darkness of the world's night. Dawn would be upon them, but not for well over an hour. They would be far from the walls of Zezerat by that time. Chandra watched Uriel's hand glow soft blue again. He clenched it into a fist, and the sourceless light that surrounded them retracted into his hand. Darkness shrouded them once more. 
The angels congregated at the base of the wall until all of them had exited the sewers. They were surrounded by the rocks and debris that littered the land around Zezerat, an effective cover for the nearly 30 angels. The pipe that Chandra and Uriel had used to get into the sewers was nowhere in sight, though the road leading up to Zezerat was barely visible to their left, as was the sparse forest that hid their approach just the day before. Fariel, Raphael's second-in-command, brought up the rear of the group. He nodded at Raphael as he joined the rest, silently acknowledging that no one was trailing behind. Onward, then. Uriel couldn't see it, but he knew from his tone that Raphael had a large grin plastered on his face. They climbed between and over boulders, occasionally dashing when cover was scarce, but it was a painfully slow pace. More than half an hour had passed and still the city walls seemed to loom over them. Moving so many bodies discreetly was arduous, but the risk of being discovered was too great to move any faster. Uriel could see where the broken ground ended and where another cluster of skeletal trees began. They were moving in nearly the same direction that Uriel and Chandra had come from. In fact, Uriel was confident that the town they were assaulting was only a few hours away from Chandra and Elena's cottage, if that. He knew the Cambian wanted to go get her sister once they were done. He would be happy to go with the half-demon to get her. The dark of night was fading by the time they reached the tree line. As soon as the angels entered the relative protection of the forest, they took off at a faster pace. Eventually, they were in a full-out run. Keep your bow ready, Uriel advised the half-demon. I worry that, should anything fly over us, death will quickly follow. Chandra nodded and slid her bow from over her shoulder into her hand without breaking her stride. It was impressive that she was able to keep up with the angels so easily. Her demonic heritage had some benefits, it seemed. For another hour they ran, unhindered by any creatures or lack of cover. The forest ended abruptly before them, however, forcing them to a stop. It extended in each direction to their side, but before them was what may have been a farmer's field some years ago. Now it was overgrown with weeds and dried brush. Midway through the field there was a house, nearly collapsed with rotten damage and a barn next to it. Surprisingly, the barn itself was in relatively good condition. Its four walls and roof were all intact, at least. The field extended as far as the angels could see to their left, but barely more than a kilometer to their right, where the forest wrapped around it and continued on the other side. It was only a few hundred meters from where they were to the other side of the field. Why have we stopped? One of the angels complained. We can be across this field in a minute. Are we really that scared that an open field should worry us? What worries us, came a quiet voice, is what I can sense ahead. The angel shuffled nervously. Uriel let his senses extend out across the field, but he could not find anything. Innocence and evil beckoned to him, even under the black clouds, but he could not feel either sensations. He focused further, searching for anything out there. What is it, Raquiel? Another angel implored. The quiet angel pointed to the barn. Vampires, the angel, Raquiel, informed the group. Two packs of them, one in the barn and the other directly across from us. Uriel had met his fair share of vampires before, though the species was pushed to the brink of extinction between the 19th and 20th centuries. The old human legends rang true. Sunlight would kill them, as would piercing their hearts. The creatures were incredibly fast, even faster than most angels, and could take immense punishment before giving in. In this world, however, the vampire would thrive. The black clouds that smothered the planet and the mere remnant of the sun's glow would allow them to walk and hunt at their pleasure. The barn must be their nest, Fariel added to Raquiel's observations. Yeriel had not yet had a chance to study the warrior. The calm, analytical way in which he spoke matched his features. He was well built, about as tall as Yeriel himself. His face was scarred, no doubt from the years he had spent on this planet, but he seemed to wear his scars with pride. There was an aura of confidence about him, though Uriel could not tell if that confidence bordered on arrogance, a sin that many angels fell victim to. For some, perhaps, but it is not large enough to house all of the beasts that I'm sensing. Raquiel's eyes seemed to bore through the barn's walls as he spoke. What is our next move then, Raphael? Fariel asked their leader. Crossing the field would likely result in conflict. We would not escape that fight without casualties. Before Raphael could give him an answer, there was movement from the forest across the field. The vampires emerged from the trees, running at an unnatural speed across the field to the barn. Some still retained human features and sprinted on two legs, pumping arms that ended in talons. Most were more bestial, though, boasting pointed ears and upturned noses. They ran on all fours and their bodies were grayish-blue, almost like a corpse. These were the oldest of the pack. Yeriel knew that the longer a vampire lived and fed, the further its transformation progressed. It was nature's way of weeding out those who were too powerful, forcing the greatest hunters away from society. With no society left, though, vampires were free to push the limits of their transformation. Damn, Chandra whispered, they're fast. They have to be, Fariel noted, if they want to take the nest. Yeriel nodded in agreement. He had also concluded that the vampires from the forest were attempting to take the nest as their own. It would mean slaughtering each other until one side was wiped out or submitted to the other. 
There was a horrid screech as the vampires who owned the nest emerged from the barn, running across the field to meet the invaders. Before the two groups collided, Uriel witnessed a terrifying figure leap from the roof of the barn, massive bat-like wings pumping it faster than the other vampires could run. A patriarch, the final stage of a vampire's transformation. The beast resembled a gothic gargoyle more than anything else. Its hands and feet extended into wicked talons that could shred a man or angel to pieces. The beast itself towered over two meters in height and its wings spanned more than twice that. His body was heavily muscled and covered in patches of gray and silver fur. A patriarch was the pinnacle of vampire power, a beast both terrible and awe-inspiring in its might. It was so strong that a pack would only allow one to exist at a time. If another vampire started transitioning to a patriarch, the others would work to kill it, no matter how many vampires were lost in the struggle. There was a sudden change in the group of angels when the patriarch revealed itself. Nobody spoke as they witnessed the beast defend its home and its family. Had the angels just encountered this many vampires, they would have emerged victorious with just a few casualties. A patriarch changed everything. The beast could take down an angel with ease, leaving an unrecognizable body in its wake. It would ravage the group before they could defeat it. Even their magic had a lesser effect against vampires. They were evil, but not creatures of hell. Vampirism was a disease that a demon had created millennia ago, but these beasts were human at their core. The angels, uneasy, moved back farther into the shelter of the trees. The patriarch swooped into the midst of the attackers, its razor-sharp talons decapitating two humanoid vampires in the blink of an eye. One of its feet grabbed onto the head of another, more animalistic vampire, and the patriarch climbed back into the sky. It pumped its wings, holding itself in place while the captured vampire flailed and tried to lash out at its captor. With its other clawed foot, the patriarch gripped the waist of its prey and pulled, tearing the beast in two. The remaining vampires had already stained the ground red with each other's blood. Beasts from each side tore into one another, ripping off limbs and tearing out hearts. The older vampires had a distinct edge over the ones that still resembled humans, but the angels watched as two or three humanoid vampires leapt onto a bestial one, tearing through its flesh and puncturing its heart. The patriarch was the deciding factor in the battle, and the attackers had clearly underestimated the other pack's strength. The great beast targeted the older vampires in the attacking pack, while the younger ones became easy targets for the rest of its family. It swept down again and again, crushing heads with the flex of its hands and shredding bodies to pieces. Even the tips of its wings ended in wicked bone spikes. After landing on a bestial vampire and tearing at its throat with its deadly maw, the patriarch quickly extended one of its wings, the point at the end piercing through the chest of a younger vampire and puncturing its heart. With a twitch, the patriarch sent the vampire's limp body flying. Let the beasts slaughter each other, Fariel said, breaking the trance that the angels had fallen into. This is not our fight. Raphael and a handful of other angels nodded in agreement. Without needing to discuss it, the group walked silently along the edge of the trees, giving the battle a wide berth and sticking to the shelter of the tree's shadows. The sounds of feral growls and shrieks of agony still rang from the clearing, but soon faded away. No doubt, the group that called the farm home had emerged victorious, but, as Fariel said, it was not their fight. Theirs was still ahead of them. Okay, and so concludes chapter 8 of Archangel. Uh, this one was really kind of preparing us for what's coming up. We've seen what's going on in the world. We've seen how things have changed and we got that tour of Zezerat. Now we need to start moving forward and the angels are very eager to get this fight going. Uriel, on the other hand, doesn't think they're actually ready to. And Chandra really just concerned about her sister. She thinks maybe she's a bit in over her head right now. Uh, this was a chapter of scene breaks too. There, I think there were four in there. So thanks for bearing with me on those awkward transitions. Not so awkward when you're reading, but a little more awkward when you're listening. One of the important thematic things we saw in this chapter was Chandra asking if these angels belong to a particular religion, which is something I get a lot of questions about from people who haven't read the book yet. And from people who have read the book, they understand where I came from on this. And as I mentioned before, I don't have a particularly religious upbringing, and I wanted my angels to reflect that. I didn't want this book to only service one group of people or alienate another group of people, um, despite what some people might think. Um, so that kind of gave me more flexibility going forward in figuring out who these angels are and making their own personalities. When I was writing Archangel, when I was researching everything from the first time, I pulled elements from, you know, your Judeo-Christian religions, from Islam, from Hinduism, from Buddhism, um, and you'll see more and more as we progress. We saw the Valkyrie in chapter 4, uh, which definitely isn't Judeo-Christian at all. The other cool thing that we saw in this chapter were vampires. And I really didn't want the vampires to just be kind of cliche, thrown in there, 
So while we don't really see them going forward, we will see vampires play a role later in the series for all you vampire lovers out there, myself included. These ones don't sparkle though. Like I said, sunlight kills them. Other than that, I hope you enjoyed chapter eight. Next week we will tackle chapter nine, which is just chock full of violence. So prepare yourselves, leave a comment down below. If you liked anything, make sure to hit that like button. Subscribe if you haven't subscribed, it really helps the channel out. And I'll drop some helpful links below too if you want to grab Archangel, you want to get some more short stories from me, or anything else. But until next time, I hope everyone's staying safe, having a good time inside. If you have to go out of the house, I hope you're staying extra safe out there, and I will see you later.